move around a little bit, but Psalms 133. Psalms 133. I don't know how many of you have been watching uh, maybe some of the state basketball and wrestling and things that have been on TV, but it's always amazing to watch teams play. I always enjoy watching them play because uh, you get to see people work together. I don't know about you, but I like it when people can work together. And uh, watching what God does and how God works uh, even when, when it comes to spiritual things, and of course God's word is, is vitally important that we learn that God is the head and we're the body. We all make up the body of Christ and we are to work together under the headship of Jesus Christ, right? So I want to begin with Psalms 133 and of course my topic today that I believe God wants us to hear is talking about unity, it's important that we walk in unity. Most of all, we walk in unity with Jesus Christ, right? You can't fulfill God's purpose for your plan, for your life, if you don't walk in unity with him. So my whole life has to come to the point where I learn to surrender to say, God, whatever it is you want to do in me, I you, let you have it. Can you imagine what would happen today if Jesus wanted to walk in unity with the Father? Where would we be? We might still be offering sacrifices. You all have to have sheep, goats, doves, pigeons. What else? Who? Bulls, yeah. Huh. Not a, ah, let's not do that. I liked it this way better. <laughs> but it's really, really important that we learn to surrender in unity to, to what the Lord. Look at all the people in Scripture that surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and let him have his way. We have pages upon pages of people that surrendered, but we also have some pages of people that didn't. And we don't want to be like that. We want to be of those that are accounted for, that learn to say yes to the Lord, right? So let's read Psalms 133 and see what it has to say. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like a precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. Father, this morning it is with our great pleasure that we come to your word for, Lord, we love it when your word defines who we need to be. It helps us become what you wanted us to be. It helps us see what we should be, Lord. And, Lord, I don't know about anybody else, but I know I'm so thankful you're patient. You're patient in working with people to get them to that place where we learn to surrender again and again to the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of God. And Lord, this morning I pray that it's no different for all of us. That Lord, as you are patient with us, that this morning each and every one of us will respond one more time, one more, one more piece of the puzzle of our life, putting into place as we respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. As we let go of whatever you don't need today and we grab onto the very things that you say we need today so that we can fulfill a purpose that is greater and bigger and more glorious than anything you and I, we, or we as people could ever drum up. And so, Lord, because it's your purpose, I'm thankful for your word. And Lord, I just want to thank you that we see oodles and oodles of scriptures today that help us to realize unity is really a powerful work of your hand. So help me, Lord, to convey it, help people to hear it, and Lord, as we learn to walk it out, Lord, it'll be a precious sight in your, in your eyes. We love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it interesting that when he describes unity right off the bat, he says how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like a precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. In other words, if you ever been by someone who had way too much cologne or way too much perfume on, and you look at them and you go, wow, 
Wonder what caused them to pick that smell. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I, they must not have showered. They got plenty on today. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. But think about it. But then you walk by a certain smell, and it's like, oh, wow, wonder what that is. I wish I had that. And all of a sudden, you got, you got a smell about you or around you that, that captivates your attention. And I find that thing with the way that God is. When God has a way to pour out his spirit, if you literally have ever been in a service where you could almost smell God moving, and that doesn't happen all the time. That is not something that God does all the time, but it does happen periodically where you can begin to smell something in the atmosphere that's greater than you've ever smelled before. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm thankful God does that, but I'm thankful it doesn't have to be all the time because we have to learn to trust him whether we smell him or not. Right? It's kind of like hearing his voice. Sometimes he's real quiet, but he's got given us his word to help guide and direct us when he doesn't talk as loud. And so it's really important to, to recognize that there's an aroma that takes place when people walk together in unity. Just as there's an aroma in the spring when the sewers open up. Just as there's an aroma when farmers begin to push their manure pile together. Or ranchers and I mean, you think about it, there's, there's aromas that catch your attention that aren't so sweet. But there's an aroma I believe God wants to continue to pour out on the church. And it's an aroma of unity. Because it's amazing what can happen when we walk together in unity with Jesus Christ. And then once again, a unity that begins to happen when we walk together with one another under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He says it's good and it's pleasant when brothers live together, notice they didn't live separately. If you're a Christian, you need to be a part of the body of Christ. And some people struggle with that with churches, and I understand that. Churches haven't always been the healthiest, let's just be honest. And they're a work in progress just like anything else. But the reality is, is that that should never stop me from being a part of the purpose that God has. Where does God want you? Where does God need you? What does he want you to do in the midst of, of gathering together? I don't know about you, but can you imagine what's happening in the Ukraine today? They're not probably meeting in public places. They're meeting in their homes. And God's still pouring out his spirit. And if God cha challenges you or brings it across you, you need to start a church in your home. Get busy. You know why? Because you're going to reach people that nobody else is reaching maybe. So don't get, don't get bent out of shape, but learn to be a part of the fellowship or whatever that looks like. However, God wants to design that. You know what? God, not everybody's going to go to a church. For whatever reason, they're not going to go. But if you can have a church come to you into your house, and you can begin to build and establish a, a healthy group of people that gather together to look at the Word of God and let it be the foundation of their life. Why can't we get excited about that? God's moving. God's doing things. And we want to see that happen. That, you know what? If there was a church that started across the road, I'd be excited. You know why? Because they're probably going to reach people I can't touch. It's not about us, people. It's about Him. And no matter what it looks like, we have to get excited about God wanting to do things in many, many different people. And how many of you know the church is a sleeping giant? It's a sleeping giant. If people in the church would begin to operate like the church is supposed to be, guess what would happen? People's lives would be touched all week long. In fact, Sunday would probably be the least populated Sunday. Because everybody would begin to see things happen maybe in their homes. Maybe in the streets or maybe somewhere else. You know what the reality is is that it's not about the building anymore. Because the building is a live building. You're a building. I'm a building. We're, we carry the presence of God. But we must remain together. We have to work together. Otherwise you can't represent Jesus Christ. Think about that just for a second. God said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. How dare we think we can do it different? 
But here's the reality. The church size only has to be two or three. Isn't that cool? It doesn't depend on numbers. God didn't say you have to have 50 to have a church. No, you can have two or three. But you've got to gather together. You've got to have a purpose of why you gather together. Why? Because it's important that each and every one of us learn to walk in unity with what he's saying out of his word, not out of what I think is the greatest idea of the world. We've got to get this picture of what God says. He says, when brothers dwell together and live together in unity. In other words, we should be benefiting one another. We should be blessing each other. We should be helping each other rather than destroying each other, especially as believers. And even as believers, we're supposed to pray for those we don't like. We're supposed to pray for our enemies. Really? Yeah, really. God says to pray for them. And so we learn to do that under the lordship of Jesus Christ because it may not fit my mentality of what I was trained to do as a person growing up. But how many of you know that you and I need to reprogram this computer between our ears with the truths that are lying in the pages of this book? I have to learn, to learn to allow these things to begin to transform me into the image of who? Jesus. Not anything else. I need to be transformed in the, the image of who God is. And if I learn to let these pages transform me from the inside out, guess what? You're going to see Jesus. You're going to see aspects of what he did and what he said. And it will all come out of this because I've allowed this work to begin to happen in me. And you and I will never be done being worked on until we take our last breath. Don't ever think that you're going to make a plateau and say, I made it. Ah, it's never going to happen here on earth. The reality is, is that you and I, once again, have to come to the place where we allow God to, to work in us so that it is like a precious oil, verse 2, poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his what? So without unity, there's no blessing. Without unity, there's not much of a blessing. Think about that. How many of you want the blessings of God? Raise your hand. Don't be a fake it till you make it. If you want the blessings of God, this has to be a part of our Christian belief. That we walk together in unity with the Lordship of Jesus Christ and, the, and the, the benefit of walking together with the body of Christ. I have to learn how to walk with you. You have to learn how to walk with me. And we do that under his Lordship. Because he's the director. He's the orchestrator. Think about your body. Could it have been developed any better? Because if men are like levels, our bubble's in the middle and then we're on the level. No, just kidding. Your body couldn't have been developed any better. The way you developed it, that's your fault. I'm just saying, I can't blame anybody else for the way I look because that's, that's just the way I eat. For me, that's just the way it is. But if I want it to look different, you can't help me. I have to do it. So the reality is, is that I have to come to the place where I learn to recognize what God's wanting to do with his body. And let me just tell you, his body is a wonderful, powerful, working machine that the devil hates. He hates it so much, he's infiltrated the very work that God calls his, the church. The devil has infiltrated the church with false teaching, which has always been the case. The church has infiltrated with hate, division, envy, jealousy, all the things that Scripture talks about that we shouldn't have in our own personal life. It's in the church. And we've got to get rid of that. Why? Because God can't build unity with things that don't build the church. And so if I'm going to be a part of this solution that God wants to do and this work that God wants to do, it, it's got to smell good. 
It's going to be something that's going to affect every aspect. Did you notice that when the oil ran down Aaron's beard, running down on Aaron's beard upon his collar, his robes, it, it affected everything about him. It wasn't just one area. It was everything. And isn't that like God? Doesn't he want control of my abilities? Doesn't he want control of my mouth? Doesn't he want control of my eyes? Doesn't he want control of my ears? Doesn't he want ability to control everything? Why? Because it's under his anointing of, of, of the Holy Spirit. It's a work that God wants to do. And so I have to be willing to surrender it all. I can't have my own opinion anymore. Because my opinion should be God's. And if it's not God's, maybe we need to learn to be quiet. Because we're not speaking for him all of a sudden. And man, is that hard to do. You ever been so right you couldn't wait to tell somebody? <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. But if I were to take that same rightness and have to stand before a holy and righteous God, I wonder how right I would be. Oh, I might be right in knowledge, but maybe the way I presented it wasn't right. You see, there's, truth, can, truth is always going to be truth, but maybe how I present truth makes a difference. And I don't know about you, I, I spoke about this last week. If you go and sit at a restaurant and you have a waiter or wait, waitress come up to you Say, what do you want? Are you sure? Okay. Take it back, bring it out, don't care what it looks like. Take it and just kind of set in front of you and say, all right, get down there and eat it then. Let's go. What are you waiting for? Come on. Thought you said you wanted this. It's good, I think. I never ate it myself, but it's good. What are you going to do? No tip. You might even get up and walk out. So why would the world or the church love that kind of service when Christians do it? How we serve God's truth has got to become very important to us. Because it's not my job to change you into what God wants you to be. That's God's job. But I might be able to influence you. I might be able to encourage you. I might be able to help you get along the way, but it's not my job to get you to respond. That's your job. So I learn to serve, and when I walk away, the rest of it is up to him. He's the one that's got to eat it. He's the one that's got to pick it up. He's the one that's got to be able to do what God wants to do. And so it's important that we learn how to serve God's truth and not try to shove it down people's throat. I used to go street witnessing in high school. My pastor, would, every, every Friday and Saturday night, we'd go out on the streets. We'd stand, talk to people, get all kinds of responses, all kinds. But if they didn't want it, we didn't try to shove it down their throat, we just blessed them. Because you can't make people do stuff. You can't make them hear, you can't make them listen, you can't make them do stuff. What you got to do is you got to live in such a way they're inspired by what they see that they want to become a part of what you're doing. And that's where I think the church in general and Christians in general have to have a lot of work done. That what we, how we serve God to other people is really, really important. Turn over to Joshua. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua had taken over for Moses. And he was leading the Israelites and he was leading them out of, the, out of bondage. They had just seen an amazing work in Jericho. The walls had came down. Joshua chapter 6. I want you to look at verse 27. Joshua chapter 6, verse 27 it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land, because the walls of Jericho had just fallen. 
And how many of you know that didn't fall because everybody was doing their own thing? That was because they were listening to what God said and how to do it, when to do it, what needed to be done. And it's no different for us today. Basically, we've got walls across the world, but how many of you know they can come down if the church would learn to listen to God? The walls will come down when we learn to hear what God's saying because we can continue to affect the world with the truths that God's given us. But look at chapter 7. But the Israelites, verse 1, acted unfaithfully in regard to devoted things. Achan, son of Camry, son of Zimrah, Zimri, that too, son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah, took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. One thing I want to remind myself and you of is, when we see that the Lord got angry, that's, how many of you know that's a righteous anger? You and I have to be careful we aren't angry at other people because of our own experiences. We have to learn to have a righteous anger, which is probably totally different than the anger that you and I may have grown up knowing and experiencing and feeling like we've got a right to be angry, but we've got to make sure that when it's the Lord's anger, it's, He was right in what He did. And He says, verse 2, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. So they sent out spies and said, Go up and check the region. I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit. You can keep on reading if you like to. And they went up to Ai, and when they came back, they gave them this report in verse 3. Send two or three thousand men to take Ai, and do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. So about three thousand men went up, and they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them, and they chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries, and struck down, struck them down on the slopes. At this, the heart of the people melted and became like water. There was a great defeat in Israel. And Achan went to God, and he said, What happened, Lord? Why, why, didn't you deli- why, did you, why did this happen? And look at verse 10, God's response. The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. What are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. And they have taken some of the devoted things, and they have stolen, they have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. And that is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. Wow, isn't that something? One guy did something wrong, and it affected the whole group. Let me say that again. One guy did something wrong, it affected the whole group. Fathers, be careful what you set in motion. Mothers, be careful what you set in motion. Be careful that what you and I do set in motion the things that God wants because there's a heritage behind us that's going to pick it up whether they like it or not. And they're going to have to learn how to deal it and sort cipher it out, whether it's from God or not, and be willing to accept. How many of you know generational sickness is not from God? So just because your mom, your dad, your grandpa, your grandma, your great-grandpa, great, all died from something doesn't mean you have to. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. Generational things. Now, they may not, I, we don't know how, how it all started, but the reality is it's been following generationally. But you don't have to continue to walk in that. We don't have to continue to do that. But here, Achan's one decision to disobey God, even though they all knew, they all knew what was supposed to be required of them, he still took it and he hid it in his tent. And God came and spoke very clearly to to Joshua. He says, you cannot stand against your enemy in the way that things are going. They turned their backs and ran because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever's among you and and is devoted to destruction. In other words, while they kept the wrong thing in the wrong camp, there was no victory and never will be until it was gone. And I think that reflects sin in my life and yours. 
We will not have victory in our camp unless I learn to get rid of things that God doesn't need or require. I have to learn how to get rid of it. Why? Because God didn't take them out of Egypt to be defeated. He took them out of Egypt to go possess the land. He, gave, he had victory in mind. He had the ability to go and do great and mighty things, but the people did not do it the way God wanted it done. Therefore, they saw defeat this one day. So Joshua lined up everybody to come in front of him. And when they got to Achan, he says in verse 19 of Joshua chapter 7, Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan replied, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord and the God of Israel. And this is what I have done. When he saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylon, Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them and they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Immediately Joshua sent messengers to go get it. Now, this is what they did in the Old Testament, but this isn't what we do today, okay? Verse 24. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, the silver, the robe, gold wedges, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. How many of you know they're going to remember Achan? They're going to remember what not to do. By no means is that a way for us to work today, is it? Because of what Jesus did. But this in the Old Testament under law is how they got rid of the problem. Was it costly? Very costly. What is the old saying? Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. So don't open the door to something God says you and I don't need. I have to be willing to close doors that God says, I don't need them anymore. I don't need it. And over Achan, verse 26, they heaped a large pile of rocks which remains to this day. And then the Lord turned his fierce anger, turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, the place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. I don't know about you, but isn't it interesting that they were willing to make sure that this wouldn't happen again? And so they had to go and consecrate themselves. Because God was going to continue to do something with them. Look at uh, verse 30, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 13 in Joshua 7, of what I didn't read. But he, sold to, he said to the people, go consecrate yourselves and tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, that which is devoted among you, O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. Consecration is a, is a getting rid of the sin. How many of you know that's a good thing? It's kind of like a sliver. You get it in, it gets infected. Well, you get the sliver out, it can heal. And that's what sin does. Sin begins to deteriorate in us, and it's not something what we want to have in our lives. So there was going to continue to be victory in what was taking place. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 4. Look at what it says. Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus and he was telling them about living a way that is honoring and pleasing to the Lord. Look at the list of things that he says to get rid of. Verse 25, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. 
In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawlings, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. Isn't it interesting that there was no conditions on all of this list? It didn't matter who wronged you. It didn't matter how they wronged you. It didn't matter any of that. God says, don't put it in the church. Get rid of it. You don't need it. It's of no value. It won't produce anything. But if you're like me, there's some things in this list i got to work on. God's not done with me yet. And I do need to get rid of them. There's some things that i got to get rid of that are in this list. But I want you to look at one verse in particular, and I don't have a great understanding of it yet. But he puts it right in the middle of all these things. Isn't it interesting? Watch. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I don't know about you, but when someone dies, people grieve. There's a loss. There's something that has taken place that you can't change in the natural. And when God tells us in his word to be careful of what we do and what we, what we accomplish in our life and that there's things that we need to get rid of, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words... Jesus didn't come into my life that I could do whatever I want with it. I can think any way I want. I can talk any way I want. I can watch anything I want. I can listen to anything I want. He didn't do that. He didn't die on the cross. He didn't give all he gave just so I could go do that. What did he do? When I welcomed Jesus Christ into my life, now I become a person that responds to the Holy Spirit that convicts me, empowers me, it gives me ability to go way beyond my wildest dreams. Why? Because Jesus Christ did that. Jesus Christ went and lived a life that was pure, holy, and righteous, and he never had one thing done wrong in his own life, but everything wrong was done to him. And I don't know about you, but it still amazes me today, and I know we're coming up on this season. That after all the hours of being beaten, they nailed him to a cross. They said you couldn't even hardly tell he was human. And he looked at him and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How many of you know that didn't come from his head? That came from the heart of the Father. That came as an obedient thing from the Father. And for me to do anything else but that is sin. Because I am not greater than Jesus. I have no right to hang on to something God told me to get rid of. Now I'm just talking about me. You have to deal with you. You have to let the Holy Spirit speak to you about what he wants you to do. But I know that I, I'm a work in progress and quite the piece of work. Amazing, God called me to do what I do. And I mean that. There's probably a lot of other people should be up here more than me, but I didn't choose it. God chose it for me. So I want to make sure that I continue to grow and do whatever God wants me to do. But the reality is, is this. For me to say... I can hang on to something God told me to get rid of 
is really a slap in the face of Jesus on the cross. And I'm not sure you and I want to do that. I'm not sure you and I are big enough to do that. That on the day of judgment, when you stand before Him, let's say, you take that road. Pretty soon, you're not going to come to church anymore. You're not going to read your Bible anymore. You're not even going to pray anymore. You know why? Because you've got a right. And I don't think that's going to stand on the day of judgment. So if it's not going to stand on the day of judgment, what am I hanging on now for? What am I hanging on now for? I have to get to the point where I learn to surrender this work that God wants to do in me and to know it's not fair, it's not right, it doesn't seem reasonable in my own mind, but if Jesus could spread his wings out, we're going to take communion and closing here this morning. But how can I take that and hold on to something God told me to get rid of? Think about that. For me, that's why I think it's so important that every single day I go to God and I say, Lord, if there's anything I need to make right today, help me to make it right. I do it daily. And somewhere along the way, maybe not right away in some areas of my life, somewhere down the road, I'll begin to see a glimmer of hope. Hey, this guy's changing just a little bit. Because how many of you know we all don't change overnight? It takes a while. But why do we change? Because I'm scared of judgment? Or because I love him so much I don't want to destroy my relationship with him? I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Because if I grieve the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you most of you will quit coming to church. You won't even want to listen to what I got to say. Why? Because I'm not operating under the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm operating on another rule of doing my own thing my own way, and I'm not going to listen to anybody. That ain't going to work. So once again, I've got to come to the place where I learn to surrender. And I give up my right. And I say, Lord, it's got to be your way. This isn't going to work if it's not your way. It's got to be your way. And so I humble myself, I bow, I give up my rights to stand and put my fist in your face and say, this isn't right. And I give up my right and say, Lord, help me to let you have your way in my life. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning, we need the Holy Spirit to work mightily in each one of us today. We need to stay away from these traps that would cause us to go away from you. We need this so we can grow in our daily relationship with you, Lord. Lord, you want us to grow. You want us to become an oak of righteousness. Not just a glimmering hope of life one day. And so, Lord, thank you that you want to work in each and every one of us this morning. And Lord, I pray that we can be honest with ourselves. And repent where we need to repent. And we can turn from the things we need to turn away from. We can't worry about down the road, but we can take care of today. We can't change where we've been because that's already done. But Lord, whatever it is we need to get right with you today, I thank you that you love us enough to bring it to our attention. For Lord, the very one thing that we do not do, do not want to do, is to grieve the Holy Spirit. It's to stand in the face of Jesus and say, what you did wasn't enough. So Lord, thank you that you love us enough to warn us. You love us enough to make sure that we don't do what Achan did. We don't do it because it it will affect our family. We don't do it because it will affect our community. We don't do it because it will affect our church. We don't do it because it will affect the world around us. And it will give the world a false image of who you are. So Lord, we do ask that you would help us today to get a full picture of what the cross really looked like. 
as we partake of communion this morning. Let it be so real this morning. Let us see what you need us to see in our everyday life. That we'll be able to take of that bread in remembrance of what you did on your body for us. That we get the benefits of it. And when you shed your blood, you forgave us of our sins so we could forgive others. Lord, I pray today that there will not be one ounce of unforgiveness in this church. For Lord, we don't want that held over our heads. But we want to be a church that surrenders to the work of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. And so, Lord, thank you that you're going to help us. You don't condemn us. You help us. You help us again and again. And Lord, I love you for that. Because we all know we need help. We all know that we need your help. So thank you, Lord God, for speaking to every one of us this morning. And that as we prepare to take communion this morning, it is a great privilege of ours that we get to share in remembering what you did for us. If someone would go back and ask the children to come back in, we're going to begin to serve communion. While they're coming, as the Bible says, we are to examine our life. 